Good morning. I would like to welcome you to the primetime Bible class this morning. We're going to be studying in Romans the 8th chapter for today's lesson. I'd like to begin our class today with reading a verse from the first chapter of Romans, Romans 1, 11 through 12. And it reads, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I'm sure uh, the part that I long to see you is true for all of us. We've been apart for a long time and we're dealing with it through this matter, matter of uh, technology. Uh, but it is good to see one another and I hope all of you are doing well. Whether I can impart any spiritual gift to you, I don't know. But I'm sure that any time that we study the words scriptures together, uh, we should be mutually encouraged in our faith. Yesterday being Halloween, I think uh, you might say that this is Dick Shaw's idea of a trick on most of you. Uh, my name is Bob Andrews, in case I haven't introduced myself. Some time ago, when Kay was not doing well, I had said to Dick I would be glad to do anything that I would be helpful. Uh, being the sneaky individual that he was, is, he phoned me up one day and asked if I was really sincere in that offer. I assured him I was, and he said, well, then you'll get to teach during November. So I guess this is a trick on you as well as on me. In any event, let's begin our study of uh, Romans, the eighth chapter. The title of our lesson for today is Freedom from Death. Uh, just a quick reminder of where we've been through some of the other studies directed by other teachers. Uh, in the beginning, God created and saw that it was good. Uh, he gave man freedoms lots of freedoms, and very few restrictions. Man, wanting to be like God, disobeyed, and he was responsible for breaking that perfect relationship. But we're told in Romans 5 and verse 6 that just at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And the purpose of the book of Romans is to unfold for us the plan of salvation that God has offered for all of us. We sometimes refer to this as grace, and it is a free gift. Paul was the right man to author such a book as Romans because he was a completely convinced man. He was raised in the very strictest sense as a Jew, well-educated, uh, understood the law, and very strongly uh, enforced it or promoted it. Uh, he did come to a point that he recognized who Jesus was and con was fully convinced that he'd been wrong previously and embraced Christianity. So he was convinced. He was convinced of sin, not only of his own, but convinced of all men. For he said in the third chapter, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He was convinced of choice. He knew that sin was a choice made by man, and salvation is also a choice, although God offers it to us. Paul was not ashamed in any way, shape, or form of the gospel. In fact, he called it the power of God for salvation. And we've arrived at a point in the seventh chapter last week under Dale's teaching that talked about the futility of man's ability to, to deal with sin by himself. Romans seventh chapter, verses 24 and 25 say, I am a miserable man. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I therefore serve the law of God with my mind, but the law of sin with my flesh. So it was a dilemma where Paul talks about the fact that he sometimes finds himself doing things he shouldn't do. And on the other hand, things that he knows he should do, he doesn't do. It's a dilemma. And we're all faced with that. We seem to be in, incapable of dealing with our own challenges and our own responsibilities. Let's begin by reading our text for today. It's not that long. It is a lengthy passage, but Romans 8, beginning in the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the Spirit's law of life in Christ has freed you from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, because of the wickedness of the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of the flesh of sin. He pronounced sen sentence on sin in the flesh, that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now they who live according to the flesh focus their attention on fleshly things, 
but they who live according to the Spirit focus their attention on spiritual things. The fleshly mind is death, but the spiritual mind is life and peace, because the fleshly mind is hatred against God, for it is not in subjection to God's law, neither can it be. Those who live according to the flesh cannot please God. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed God's Spirit is living in you. If anyone does not have Christ's Spirit, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, the body is indeed dead to sin, and the Spirit is alive to righteousness. If the Spirit of the one who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will give you life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. As many as are led by, the God's, by God's Spirit, these are the sons of God. You have not received the spirit of slavery again to fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship, by which we are crying, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, and if children, then also heirs, heirs indeed of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We suffer together that we may be glorified together. There's a lot in this passage, but I intend to concentrate on basically three main points. Number one, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Number two, the Spirit is a gift offered to assist us in living freely uh, from the sentence of death. And three, man is expected to set his mind on spiritual things. R.C. Bell, a well-known educator of the early 1900s in our fellowship, said, The book of Romans is like a diamond ring. The eighth chapter is the diamond in the ring, and verse 28, the sparkle in that diamond. So we've reached a point here where Paul has described the pitiful situation of man, the, the times that he's uh, disappointed God, the times he's rejected God, and a totally helpless state in and of its own. But we've reached a point where he's also described the fact that Christ came and offered his life as a sacrifice for us, and that now there is no condemnation for us. He has paid that debt. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this passage talks about the contrast of two laws. The old law, being particularly the law of Moses, was referred to as the law of sin and death. Law is not capable of dealing with sin. It only exposes sin. It exposes the points where we're inadequate. And no man had ever been able to keep the law perfectly except Christ. The, the law offers no relief or no remedy for the sentence that is coming with the breaking of the law, that would be the sentence of death. No man can serve two masters. Either you will love the one and hate the other, or hate the one and love the other. In other words, you can't hold on to the law and still be under the plan that God has offered us through grace in this new law. The new law, referred to as the law of life, is sometimes referred as God's coordinated plan a plan that he came up with before creation, we're told. It's a plan that involves the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all three personalities of the Godhead. Uh, some would outline Romans as being God the Father's role in creation, Romans 1 through 3.20, God the Son's role in salvation, Romans 3.21 through 7.25, and God the Spirit's role in our sanctification, Romans 8, 1 through 39. Sanctification is defined as the art of making or declaring something holy or the action or process of being freed from sin. So in this passage in Romans 8, we're going to talk about the fact that the Holy Spirit adds on to what Christ did for us, the focus of uh, his life on earth after he left. In the new law, we refer to the three parts of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. These three are in cooperation with one another and never contradict one another. Jesus spoke what the Father authorized him to say. John 12, 
49 says, I have not spoken but from myself, for he who for the one who sent me, the Father himself, has commanded me what to say and what to speak. The Spirit re re uh, revealed God's word. In second, 1 Corinthians set, number 2, uh, verse 10, But God has revealed them to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit examines all things, even God's deep things. The message was delivered by the Son himself. In former times, we're told that God spoke to men through prophets, but they didn't always listen. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by prophets at various times and in many ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds. So all three personalities of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, agree with the plan that God has set in motion. They do not contradict one another, and their roles never uh, interfere with one another. The law of life is offered to those who believe in Christ. In other words, faith in action. We must believe, uh, and this belief must affect our uh, behavior in such a way on several main points, but just to name a few, we have to be fully convinced that Jesus is said is who he said he was. We must believe the circumstances about his birth and the, how he entered the world. We must believe his teachings. And his teachings specifically talk about a different way of doing law. He talks about the old law being uh, very crisp and clean, where the new law operates more on motivation. For instance, he talks about the old law saying, Thou shalt not kill. But he says, I'm telling you, don't even hate your brother. He talks about adultery, a specific act. But he says, I tell you, don't even look on a woman to lust after her. It's all about our motivation. Uh, he's not talking about just a bunch of rule keeping. So he, we must believe his teachings. And those teachings then, uh, on the basis of our faith in him, influence our actions. Jesus also talked about the fact that he was promoting or he was bringing to light a righteousness that would exceed that of the Pharisees and scribes. These were leaders of the Jewish people who not only hammered the people with the law of Moses, but they also went on to add their own twists on it, add rules and regulations perhaps that God never even intended. Uh, and this is a warning to anyone not to be adding to or taking from what God has in mind. And so when Jesus is talking about it, he says the righteousness that he's asking of us exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. And finally, <clears throat> of the things that I've chosen to talk about, we must be fully convinced of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We're told in Scripture that if we don't believe in resurrection, we're, the most we're of most people most pitiable. In other words... These things are facts. If we don't believe in them, it will not it will influence not will influence our lives and our actions as they should. This new law, this law of life, offers relief from the sentence of death. The beginning scripture we read today says there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus paid the price. The uh, pure lamb of God who was able to keep the law had no reason to be put to death was put to death on our behalf not on his uh, life uh, as we're talked about here is the relationship of a walk restored as I said in the beginning God created man and thought it was saw that it was good and man and God had a relationship where they would walk in the garden and they would converse but man's behavior broke that relationship where now Christ has brought it back, where we can have, through his sacrifice and through the assistance of the Holy Spirit, a relationship with God where it's more like a walk, a conversation where God talks to us, we talk to him. And we're back on a path where we can have a hope of spending the rest of our lives with him. The gift of assistance while we await final judgment is the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Which brings me to my second point. The Holy Spirit is a gift 
that was offered at baptism and was to assist with our walk. Jesus pronounced, or pardon me, announced that gift when he said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This gift of the Holy Spirit, what really is involved there? Certainly I will not be able to cover everything, nor do I claim to be able to understand everything. But there are a few things that we point to in Scripture that talks to us about the role that the Holy Spirit plays that I think gives us some inkling of what we can expect from this gift and how we will recognize it in our lives. First of all, the Holy Spirit supervised the inspired writings of Scripture. We find that in Ephesians 6, 17, that all Scripture is useful for teaching. Uh, in Romans, or pardon me, Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 and 3, uh, 16. The Holy Spirit puts God's laws in our hearts and in our minds. They're not written on tablets of stone. They're written in our hearts. Hebrews 10, 15 through 18. Also the Holy Spirit has testified to us after he said, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts. I will write them on their minds. And he said, No longer will I remember their sins and iniquities. Jesus told us the Holy Spirit was going to be given as a helper. Jesus knew and then told his uh, disciples that he was going to be leaving, but that after he left, a helper would be sent. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper who, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. In this passage that we read today in the 8th chapter in verse 10, it talks about the Spirit being the giver of life. <coughs> Excuse me. This, this chapter also talks about it being our confirmation as adopted sons. We know that Jesus was God's only son, but that he's given us the opportunity to be adopted as sons. In Romans 8 and 15, it says, You have received the spirit of sonship, by which we are crying, Abba, Father. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't pretend to be a professor of languages, but I understand this passage to say the business of Abba, Father, is a very close and personal relationship, like we might say to our own dad, daddy, or something very uh, respectful, loving. And so we have been given this opportunity to be considered sons, not just distant sons, but fully adopted sons. The role of the Spirit is also to be our assurance of our inheritance. We know that though we're baptized here, we have accepted the sacrifice of Christ, that we don't leave this world right away. And there is a time between now and when will be final judgment. And this is our assurance. If we know that we have the Holy Spirit with us to comfort, to lead us into truth, to be our helper, as Jesus said, it is like an inheritance confirmation. Romans 8, verse 17, it sees heirs indeed of God and fellow heirs of Christ. <clears throat> and one other thing that I want to mention here as we uh, finish this part about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us to the Father in prayer communications. Romans 8 and 26, which we'll talk about more next week, says the Spirit helps us in our weakness because we do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf, uh, on behalf of our inexpressible groanings. So, <clears throat> the way I view this Spirit, or recognizing its ability and its activity in our lives, is that God communicates uh, to our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Sometimes that's only through the, the Word of God that has been inspired by him, but there may be other ways that God has influence in our lives that the Spirit speaks to us, reminding us of things we may have forgotten, serving somewhat like a conscience, you might say. He helps us respond and communicate with God. Occasionally in our lives, there are things we don't know how to really express. Maybe there's a tragedy that's hit. Maybe there's a circumstance we don't understand. Maybe we're facing severe persecutions and we don't know how to deal with it. But the Spirit speaks to God on our behalf, we're told. And it guides us in our walk here on earth. 
So it's more like a restoring of a man, uh, communication with the Father that was in the first uh, creation story, where before man broke his relationship with God, it seemed that they had some pretty open and free and loving conversations. And through this sacrifice of Christ and the assistance of the Holy Spirit, some of that has been restored to the point that we can feel free to enter uh, into a conversation with God about things that are concerning us. So what's man's role in all of this? <clears throat> Since it's a gift described by Peter, it's still an ongoing process. It's not a one-time event where we just get it, that's it, end of story. Romans 8 and 5 says, but they who live according to the Spirit. And 8 and 14 says, as many as are led. Those are action words. Those are things that are ongoing. Those are processes. Uh, it is a choice. It doesn't mean that the gift is given to us stuffed down our throats. The Spirit does not force us to act. It doesn't coerce us and it doesn't drive us. It is described as a leading. Again, 8 and 14, as many as are led. This indicates not only that it's a process, but it's also a choice. Not everyone is willing to be led. So if we allow the Spirit to lead us, uh, it is a choice on our behalf. It's a mindset. The scripture talks several times in here about the law of the flesh. People who walk according to the law of the flesh have their minds set on fleshly things, and those who walk according to the Spirit have their minds set on spiritual things. And we don't need to look any further than Galatians 5 to tell us what that's all about. The Spirit of the flesh, or the things of the flesh, are fornication, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, strife, jealousy, wrath, and on and on. The, the fruit of the Spirit is described as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faith, gentleness, self-control. So I guess the question is, what is our mind set on? We might, what is our thought when we get up in the morning? What is our last thought before we go to bed at night? Are we thinking about how we can get gain, worldly gain, and even if we have the right motivation for getting morally gain, are we thinking it, it's for our own pleasure? Or are we thinking if I can gain uh, financial uh, abilities that I can help other people? What is the motivation? What is our thought? What is our, what is our uh, mindset as the scripture talks about it here? Are we set on the spirit? Or are we set on the flesh? Do we stop and think about uh, how we can get even with that person that's hurt us? Do we think about that person that opposes us in business or in politics or just has offended us in some way? Are we consumed with how to get even with them? Or do we do, as the scriptures say, we pray for our enemy and think how can we share God's love with that person? What is our mindset? We are to remain open to the leadings of the Spirit, not to harden our hearts. <clears throat> in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1622, the scripture reads, Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, because it is God's will in Christ Jesus for you. Do not extinguish the Spirit. Do not count inspired messages as nothing. Test everything. Hold to fast to what is good. Turn away from every form of evil. So apparently it's possible, though we've been uh, granted access to salvation through Christ's death and he's paid our debt and the fact that he's given us a spirit to help us apparently it's possible for us to thwart this activity in other words to quench the spirit to uh, harden our hearts not to accept the direction the leading of the Holy Spirit in this passage in Thessalonians it says do not extinguish the spirit don't put out its power uh, to deliberately reject its leadings and instructions to not develop and use the relationship that's provided through the Spirit to God. It's talked about the hardening of the hearts. In several places in Scripture, we talk about people uh, who hearts were, hearts were hardened, and they were not able to accept the guidance or the request to operate, uh, do as God asked them to do. And finally, it testifies to us the status of, uh, that we are as, of God, as God's children. Romans 8 and verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit 
that we are God's children, and if children, then also heirs. This is somewhat a curious passage. It says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, with our spirit. One capitalized, one's not. What, what does that mean? I believe it means that the Spirit of God teaches us what we ought to do. Our spirit, or our own minds, we know whether we've done that or not from the heart. We can put on all kinds of uh, fronts. We can let people believe one thing, but we know whether we've done what God's asked us to with the full, complete conviction of our hearts. So what is the relevance for us today? These teachings were offered to the Roman church by this letter of Paul, and we're reading someone else's mail, you might speak, might say. But of course you know that these letters have a meaning to be applied for us. I believe they're very similar to what Paul had to begin with. We must be convinced of sin, especially of ours, but also of the whole world. Convinced to the point that we not only do something and look for salvation, ask what must I do to be saved, but we also must be pressed with the responsibility of teaching that and spreading it to those around us, whether they be Jew or Greek, uh, slave or free, whatever. It is a conviction that if we do not do something about our sin, which we can't do, if we do not access our, our gift that's given us through Christ's death, then we can expect death. We must recognize and acknowledge our inability to resolve the problem. The prophet of old said that it is not within man to direct his own steps. So we must understand that we can't do it. We've tried a lot of things through history. We've probably tried a lot of things in our own lives, but we are unable to deal with the sin, even the guilt of sin, never mind the consequences of sin. We must be willing to publicly, unashamedly express our faith in the gospel message and its power. There's no point in sneaking around and trying to keep one foot in the world and one foot in Christ's sacrifice or accepting Christ's sacrifice. If we are ashamed to... Uh, openly and willingly uh, announce the salvation that's offered through Christ, the gospel message, because it's the only power for salvation. We must accept and cooperate with the leadings of the Spirit. And we know whether we're doing that or not. When we read the scripture and something comes to our attention, are we willing to examine ourselves and make adjustments? Are we willing to do the things that he wants us to do? Do we regularly go through him to deal with our conversation with God? How often do we spend time just talking to God through the Spirit? And when we don't know what to say, have confidence that he's willing to express our thoughts. The scripture also says the advantage of using the Holy Spirit is that he does things according to God's will, not according to our will. So that's the, the prayer that would be expressed. And as we've just discussed, we must make sure that we do not neglect such a great salvation. We can't do anything on our own. Christ did it all for us freely, and he offered it to us freely. Not only did he offer it to us, he offered us a helper to keep us safe in his arms until that day when we will begin our ultimate glory. And I guess that is talked about in Hebrews 2 and verse 3. But I want to finally just wrap up with a passage that I think sometimes is overlooked, where we talk about uh, communing with on the first day of the week at the Lord's Supper. And in 2 Corinthians 15, verse 5, uh, pardon me, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, it said, Let a man examine himself, and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup in an appropriate manner. If one eats or drinks who does not recognize the Lord's body, he eats and drinks condemnation to himself. And in 2 Corinthians 15 and 5, it also says, we need to be examining ourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize that about this about yourselves, that Christ died, Christ is in you, pardon me, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. So, we need to stop and think. Are we walking according to the Spirit? Have we accessed the sacrifice that Christ gave? Uh, 
Are we listening to the leadings of the Spirit? And are we quenching the Spirit? It's our job to remain soft-hearted, to be willing to accept the prods and the urges of God's will through Scripture. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for your beautiful plan that you have offered to us, the salvation through your Son, Christ. We regret that you had to give him the pain, watch the pain that he had to go through on our behalf, but we understand that it was the only way and you were loved us so much that you were willing to give that for us. We thank you for the special gift of the Holy Spirit and the role that he plays in keeping us close to your word and in your grace. We ask you to help us to examine ourselves on a regular basis and to make the necessary judgments. And please help us to be fully aware that it is our responsibility to share this opportunity, this gift, with others around us. We pray these things through Jesus' name. Amen.